with the the spikes is on dividers for the van. Do there. Well, I know what we need to do. We need to put tires on the van. Amen. Pretty simple. Uh, just figure out uh, what kind of tires, how much money we won't spend. Amen. And uh, my daddy used to also say, my old daddy had a lot of sayings. Uh, some of them were good. Some of them I can't tell you in public, but some of them. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say, it don't cost much more to go first class. And uh, so I used that a lot when I was selling siding jobs. And, you know, people talk about this or that. I'd say, ah, it don't cost much more to go first class. Oh, boy, look me dead now one day, Lee. And he said, it does if you fly American <laughs> Airlines. <laughs> So I went back to the other saying that he used to have all the time, and that is, uh, uh, it, it ain't no disgrace to be poor, but it sure is unhandy sometimes, you know. And, uh, uh, but either way, they, uh, um, yeah, there is a blessing. And so we're glad to have you all with us tonight. I, I know that um, uh, John chapter 10, verse 10 is where we'll kick it off and begin tonight, but uh, I know it seems that we've repeated some things in this series of lessons, and that's, that's, that's true. It, it seems to me, and, and y'all can probably verify this, or uh, uh, if you say amen real loud, then I'll know I'm on the right track. But um, sometimes God will, will use different messages with the same baseline for two or three, four or five weeks in a row, Okay. It seems like, and we've been talking a lot about emotions, I know, on Wednesday night, but that also leads over into our Sunday school class on Sunday mornings on spiritual disciplines, and, and it all ties together. And like I said the other day, um, if everything revolves around your spirit, and so if your spirit's not right, nothing else in your life's ever going to be exactly right. Now, you can try, and you can fill it with this, and you can fill it with that, and you can chase this, and you can chase that. I uh, shared something on Facebook I saw the other day that said, for years, when I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, I was never addicted to drugs, but simply because I was too broke to afford them and didn't want to get caught selling them, so never did get into that mess, but uh, small town, everybody knew everybody, and so I uh, never did get into that, but it said when they were addicted to drugs and alcohol that they cried many times for God to kill them for God to just kill them and get it over with. And it said it wasn't until I prayed and asked God to save me that he did something in my life. Okay? Because God's not willing that any should perish. Okay? And so God, God's going to give you opportunity. And you say, well, if that's the case, he'll always take care of me. No, not always. Uh, you go back and read the Bible. There was a lot of people that came to the end real quick. Okay? Remember David's son got hung in a tree? Uh-huh. Yeah, God's always got ways. And so, uh, uh, but everything seems to tie together. And so I challenge you, if there's an issue with your spirit, to deal with it first before you try to deal with anything else. God wants us to be emotionally whole, okay? And that's why I think he keeps going back over these lessons because he wants to make sure we get it, right? You ever had to tell your kids something more than once? Why? Because you wanted to make sure they got it, right? Yep. Amen. Uh, but God wants us to be physically, spiritually, and emotionally whole because he wants us to be like Jesus. Okay? Now, we're not ever going to be perfect like Christ, but we can try to be like Christ. Okay? And, uh, uh, and so in the next few weeks, hmm, uh, probably going to kill our Wednesday night attendance here, but we're going to do it anyway. For the next few weeks, we're going to look at these things. Okay? Anxiety, fear, guilt, anger, and rejection. Because one of those five is probably what messes up your emotions the most. Okay? My wife said today, well, I don't have a problem with anger. <laughs> I said, when you think of anger, you think of yelling, screaming, lashing out at someone, right? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, that kind of answered the question right there. But she said, well, yeah. And I said, you can be angry and not lash out. Right? Yeah. Uh, and it's okay to be angry under control. It's when you get angry and give them the silent treatment. You just well have lashed out at them, right? Well, I didn't say anything. I don't know what they're mad about. Because your eye rule said it all. Okay? 
and I'm surprised that not every man in here said amen, other than the fact that you know where you stand, right? Yeah, Tom thought it. I'm really surprised Tom didn't say it. His wife isn't here, you know. Yeah, amen, brother. And so, <laughs> repeat that when she gets here, right? And uh, so tonight we're going to start by looking at seven keys, if you will, for becoming emotionally whole. And uh, so in the next few weeks, we're going to look at those five things. And you probably need to be here for at least one of those, right? Whether it's, it, 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 you need to be here for all five of them actually, but whether it's anxiety, fear, guilt, anger, or rejection that you're dealing with for the most part in your life, uh, we'll try to help you get through that. But I want to tell you that all five of those go back to these seven things tonight. Okay? If you get these seven things tonight down, then it doesn't mean that those other things aren't going to pop up and, and, and crop up once in a while, but you'll know how to deal with them. You'll know how to deal with them rightly. Okay? And so uh, um, it, it's, it's, some of it's pretty simple, and some of it we've been over and over before. And, uh, um, but number one, give your heart to Christ. That's where it all begins, folks. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, okay? But Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Our all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Uh, but the wages of sin is death. Uh, we know all of that Roman road, right? Most of the people in here know that Roman road. And so uh, learn the Roman road, by the way. Open the fly leaf of your Bible first, front page of your Bible, and write down Romans 3.10. Go there and, and then get the next one and the next one and, and write it. Mark your Bible so that you'll know. Uh, it is a terrible thing if somebody, if you tell some, ask somebody, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? And they say no, and you don't know what to do next. Amen? You ought to be prepared. But it begins with giving your heart to Christ. Uh, uh, having a relationship with Christ will resolve many issues that undermine being emotionally whole. Okay? Uh, if you don't have that re a right relationship with Christ, then you're going to feel guilty a lot because guilt comes from the consequences of unforgiven sin. If you notice, I didn't leave any blanks tonight. Okay? I didn't want you to have to worry about trying to fill in things because I want you to take this home so you can reference back to it in the next four or five weeks. Okay? Feeling guilty because guilt comes from unforgiven sin. Because any, uh, let me back up, all bitterness is against who? It's against God. Well, no, I'm not bitter at God. I'm bitter at them because of the way they treated me. No, you're bitter at God because he didn't strike them dead. All bitterness is against God. And so you've got to deal with it in the spiritual realm before you can ever deal with it in the human realm. Okay? And so uh, feeling guilty, uh, it, it, will, it won't completely disappear, but you'll have a lot less of it once you get saved. Amen. Uh, feeling unloved. I know that uh, there's some folks in here that have talked about uh, relationships that they grew up in and, and, and things that they grew up in and, and uh, 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 not really feeling loved at home. And so when you get saved, then you have to accept the fact that God loves you. It doesn't really matter whether anybody else likes me or not. I know Jesus loves me. Okay. I don't wear my feelings on my coat sleeve. I, I try not to get too upset about things. I try to be fairly laid back and, and, and it pretty much even keel most of the time. Most of the time. Hush, woman. Most of the time. I'm preaching, not you. You just. I didn't say a word. I know, but that eye roll. <laughs> I saw that eye roll, amen. And so, uh, you may need to sit in the back the rest of these lessons, but uh, so I can't see that far back, you know. But uh, uh, but uh, feeling unloved, and it comes from uh, not everyone grows up in a loving home, That's right. and so that damages your emotions, right? Because you're, you're you're some people go out of their way seeking to be loved. Some people go out of their way not wanting to be loved. Some people go to this extreme. Some people go to that extreme because they didn't grow up in a loving home. And so when you get saved, you have to get to the point in your life where you realize that God loves you just as you are because he's the one that created you that way. Okay? And then uh, number three, uh, having a spirit of revenge. You're going to get even with everybody until you got saved, wouldn't you? I'll show them. 
I'll be honest with you. In my life, it was even after I got saved. I've told you before, I sat in Walmart parking lot one day trying to figure which brake line I could cut so he'd get out of town where he didn't hurt anybody else, but not all the way home. And I thought, man, I don't need to be thinking like that. I don't want them too old to crawl in their car anymore, but <laughs> we got to find an easier way. <laughs> but it, that unforgiving attitude, when you get right with God, then you come to the place to realize that when people lash out at you, especially as a Christian, when people lash out at you, they're not lashing out at you, they're lashing out at what you stand for. And that changes things, doesn't it? Because they're not taking it out on you. Yeah, they may yell and scream and blow up at you. They're not taking it out on you, they're taking it out on what you stand for. And that's a good thing because they know what you stand for. Uh, having a spirit of revenge, you don't have to worry about getting uh, even with people. Salvation was a free gift to us and it's also a free gift to others. Amen. Okay? Don't ever, uh, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> please don't ever let me hear you say, well, they, they don't deserve to be saved. Because neither did you or I. Yeah. Amen. I had a guy tell me one time, well, I just don't think we want him in church. He's not really church material. I said, maybe we want him and not you. Yeah. Right. So having a spirit of revenge, number four, trying to earn God's favor. Anybody ever been there? Keep pedaling that bicycle? Because if you ever quit pedaling that bicycle, you're going to fall over, right? That's the way we, we, we were taught, especially in a, lot, in a lot of, if you've ever been in a legalistic church, you got to perform in order to be accepted, right? Performance-based acceptance. And if you don't perform right, then you're not accepted. If you don't dress right, walk right, talk right, spit the right color, you don't belong here. You need to go somewhere else. Well, okay, I need to go somewhere else. Guess what? I'm somewhere else. Okay? Uh, we all know the story of, of me almost turning it down because I thought y'all were legalistic. And the reason you made the questions the way you did is because you didn't want somebody that was legalistic. And we about missed each other in crossing to try to keep legalism out of it. And so, uh, but we can't earn God's favor. God's love is, uh, for us is based on what Christ did for us, not on what we can do. Amen. Because what is it Isaiah says? That all of our righteousness are as a filthy rag in the sight of God. You do the very best you can, and God says, I don't want it. It's just a filthy rag. And so give your heart to Christ, and when you do, those things will change. It may not happen overnight, but it will happen with time. I uh, made the comment tonight to someone, an OAA saying, we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Okay, I know I'm not everything God wants me to be, but on most days I'm trying to head in the right direction. Okay, when you get genuinely born again, those things will begin to lessen in your life to the point that people do something to you, you realize they're not lashing out at me, they're lashing out at God. Uh, the, you, you don't have to worry about trying to get even with everything. Uh, you don't have to feel guilty about things. Uh, uh, it, it, you don't have to try to earn God's favor. And so, number two, uh, in, in order to try to become emotionally whole and do things the way God wants you to do, you need to learn to read and study the Scriptures because it's very important for us to know what God says about us, right? Someone want to read Galatians 3, 26 and 27? Brother Bob? been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. You're the children of, Christ, uh, of God. We're an heir with Christ and a joint, uh, uh, heir of God, joint heir with Christ. And so uh, 1 John 5, 1 and 2, anybody want to read that? 1 John 5, 1 and 2, you need to understand that you are God's child. Brother Tom? We love God and keep His commandments. We love the children of God. You need to remind yourself that you are a child of God. 
You are a child of God. And there's nothing you can ever do to break that. Amen. Not going to happen. And so what does God say about you? God says that you're his child. God says that we're accepted completely by God. When you got saved, how many of you, when you got saved, God said, okay, well, I, I, I'm going to save you except for this one issue right here, and I can't deal with that. No. We were completely forgiven. Amen. Right? I mean completely. Even the things that I wasn't ready to turn loose of, he forgave me for. Even the things I didn't think he knew about at the time. I was 32, young and dumb. <laughs> Even the things I didn't think he knew about, he still forgave me for because he knew about it. Amen. You know, there's a song, uh, 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 Jesus, I don't want to open that door. I, I'm not ready to open that door. I don't want to go into that closet. I don't want to go into that private part of my life. But when you get saved, God opens all those doors. And boy, some of them are painful, aren't they? Some of them hurt, but we need to re remember and realize that we're accepted completely by God. Amen. Okay? I don't have to, I mean, okay, let me, I started to say something that's not entirely true. I started to say, I don't have to please people around here, but you pay me. So, yes, I do have to please some people around here. Okay? As a pastor, as a born-again child of God, my salvation is not based on any of y'all. Okay? I told somebody one day, I said, you think what you want because my road to heaven don't go through your yard. <laughs> I really don't care what you think. Okay? But God forgave us completely and we're completely accepted by God and we're an heir. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Anyone want to read that? Brother Jerk. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of person, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. No respecter of person. Boy, I like that verse. I like that truth. Because God doesn't think any more of you than he does me and doesn't think any more of me than he does you. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Amen. No big I, little you. No big me, little you. No big you, little me. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all accepted completely by the Lord. Uh, Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 6. Anyone got Ephesians? Bob? I'm sorry, Curtis. Spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm sorry. Not good. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. We're not accepted because of who we are. We're accepted because of what Christ did for us. Yeah. Okay? And so then we're an heir through Jesus. Galatians 3 29. Curtis? Heirs according to the promise. We're heirs according to the promise. The promise of God, not the promise of Harold Holt. Not the promise of Sarah Road Baptist Church, but the promise of God. Amen. Amen. So, uh, uh, Titus 3 7. Anybody got Titus 3 7, Tom? Being justified by what? By His grace. Not by our grace, but by His grace that we have eternal life. So, what does it mean to put on Christ? What, is, what does it mean to put on Christ? Okay? If you go to a public swimming pool, hopefully you put on a bathing suit. Okay? It means to be prepared. To put on Christ. Okay? You ought not leave your home without decent clothes. Okay? I mean, uh, and, and I'll leave that to you to define whatever decent is because I don't care. Okay? But, the truth of the matter is we ought not to leave our home without putting on Jesus, without making sure we're taking Christ with us, okay? Because you get up in the morning and you, you, you're running late, you don't have time to read your Bible, you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to do all those things. About noon, your day's not going real well, is it? Mm -hmm. Because you didn't put on Christ before you left. 
And so uh, it, we need to learn to put on Christ. So read and study the scriptures. We ought to immerse ourselves in the scriptures uh, because they have so much force. Number three, uh, if we're going to be emotionally whole, we have to learn to trust God's healing for our faults, not our own. Amen. And, and you don't have to tell, you don't have to say what uh, it can be chocolate it can be cough drops it can be tic tacs whatever it is anybody in here ever been addicted to anything that you would acknowledge I see some of y'all aren't raising your hands but boy you can't hardly wait to get that coffee pot when you get here <laughs> don't tell me you're not addicted okay yeah don't tell me you're not addicted. I mean, I, that, was, that was some buckshot preaching right there. It hit everybody in this room. And some of y'all, it took a little while to, to, to realize it, right? But it got every one of you. Because those that aren't addicted to chocolate and donuts are addicted to coffee. And most of us have kind of crossed lines on that, except coffee's nasty. But, um, but here's the thing. You ever tried to quit? You ever quit for a day or two and then go back? Because willpower is, 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 is something else, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I've heard stories. I never did smoke. But I've heard stories of people that would quit smoking and, and, and be, not be smoked for a year or two and walk up to a group of people that were standing there smoking and just smell it and say, give me a cigarette and go back smoking. Now, when I was chewing back all the time, I had my brother-in-law's little brother was going to quit. And so we were working, framing houses, and he was going to quit. And finally, about the third day, I said, Larry, either you're going to have to go back dipping or I'm going to have to quit because I can't afford both of us. <laughs> it just ain't working that way. Okay? But here's the thing. When you try to quit something in your own power, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. In, in the world of alcoholism, they have what they call a dry drunk. You know what that is? That's somebody that hadn't touched alcohol in however long, but they're still acting just like they're drunk. Okay? They still have all the same personality traits. They still have all the same problems in their life. They still deal with things all the same. They've never gotten over that. See, I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I'm a redeemed alcoholic. Amen. Big difference. Okay, if I was just recovering, then the chance is I'd go back to it. But I'm redeemed, and so I don't have to worry about that. But I trust God's healing for my faults, not my own. Okay, whatever it is in your life that you're trying to overcome, if if you're trusting in your own uh, strength and your own abilities, sooner or later you're going to get wore down and give in. All right. Um, uh, so when you when, you, when you're trying to overcome something, do you focus more on your faults and weaknesses or on your strengths? Okay, let me see if I can break that down and help you understand a little bit better. Uh, there's only, uh, I think, two people here tonight that were charter members of Sarah Road Baptist Church. And so we'll give Mike and Gary a pass on that one. But uh, for the rest of us, the very first time you walked into this church, were you concerned about your strengths or your weaknesses? Weaknesses, 100%. Weaknesses. Why is that? Because that's human nature. Uh huh. Because the devil knows he can mess us up with that, right? Okay. When I came, the very first Sunday I came, I was hesitant. But I sat in the parking lot and purposely worked on my strengths instead of my weaknesses okay and I've told you before we went through Sunday school and it was dry as a biscuit with no gravy I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way it was just life okay I got up to preach and I thought Lord you put me in the wrong place but you know what one of my strengths is is getting people to smile Okay, So you may have saw it as a weakness, but I knew what my strength was. My strength was to get people involved. Amen. Okay, And so I worried more about my strength. Now, I haven't always done that. Okay, There's some Sunday mornings when I come through that door right there and I've got my weaknesses on my mind more than I do my strengths. And so it's a reoccurring thing you have to keep working on. 
But when we trust God's healing for our faults, we'll focus more on our strengths than we do on our weaknesses. Okay? I'll pick on Gina for a minute. She rededicated her life to the Lord at our revival. And so when the first time she walked through this door, it should have been more about strengths than weaknesses. But that's not human nature, is it? The first time you walked through this door, it was more about weaknesses than it was strengths. Because what are people going to think? We are <coughs> moving things around, in case you haven't noticed. The foyer back here where the coffee room is has became too small. In case y'all didn't know that. Wasn't tonight. Wasn't bad tonight. But on Sunday morning, you have six or eight people come in and sit down and nobody else can get through. And because it's small, the people on this side are talking to people on this side, so everybody's hesitant to break up a conversation. And so we have people standing at this door, lying back up here, people standing at the other door that are trying to get back and forth. I mean, I, if I get caught in here and I find out Brother Lee went in that middle door and there, or back door back there and there's donuts back there, I'm going to bust up your conversation because I'm going to the kitchen. <laughs> okay? So what have we done as a result of that? This is part of, of growth consequences, okay? I, if you'll notice back there in the fellowship hall, instead of taking all those tables down, I set uh, f two tables long and two tables wide in three different sections, okay? And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to enjoy things for a while. I was going to have Jan make some signs today, and I didn't get around to it. We're going to make a sign and put on that first table up there that says Bible, Okay? So if you want to sit down and discuss the Bible, you can sit down at those tables, okay? And then this other table over here, we're going to put a sign on it that says health. And so if you want to sit down and talk about how bad your health is, you can sit at that table over there. <laughs> and then at the back table, way back there by the nursery, we're going to put one that says politics. I went, to, I went to all the trouble, set those tables up just so I could say that tonight. <laughs> I don't care where you sit, but the truth of the matter is our coffee room has gotten too small. And so we're going to get a plug in put in and we're going to rotate that, co uh, that, uh, that coffee counter around to the other side there from the men's restroom going that way. Besides that, it's always bothered me to have men up there pouring them a cup of coffee and a lady open the door of the restroom coming out or going in, either one. That's kind of uh, a bad thing. And so we're going to put it over there on the other side by the kitchen uh, counter going that way and move everybody out of that little bitty room where it's only six or eight into a fellowship hall where we can have 10 or 20. Okay? Our goal is to grow, right? Our goal is to grow people, right? And so we want to make that just a pass through, okay? So when you come in Sunday and there's no chairs in there, don't bite my head off. You knew it was coming, okay? And make it just a pass through and just pass right on through and go in the fellowship hall and sit down. And so actually the table that I said politics, I set that up in case... Uh, Katie and them want to use it for children's church instead of being in the nursery. And so it's not really for politics. Don't go back here and discuss that. That causes church splits. So, um, but anyway, uh, we're accepted completely by God. We're an heir uh, through Christ. I'm on the wrong point. We need to trust God's healing for our faults and focus more on our strengths than we do our weaknesses. Okay, get this. God has a plan for every detail of your life. If God created you tall, he created you tall for a, per for a reason. Okay? You're not tall because your mama gave you Gerber baby food. Okay? You're not short because she didn't have enough milk at home. Okay? You are what you are because God created you. Okay? You can't, the Bible says we can't add, add one, 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 one bit to our stature. Okay? And so tall, short, fat, skinny, whatever. God made you so that he can use every detail of your life. Okay? Uh, by the way, they say fat people are harder to kidnap, so I'm working on it, okay? And so uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get there. But uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. He said he's safe. Is that what he said? I'm safe. Yeah, I'm safe. Don't have to worry about that one. Ain't nobody going to throw me in the back of a van. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so, but he, he created you the way that you are so that he could use every detail of your life. Okay, you were created with God-given talents. And so focus on those strengths instead of those weaknesses. And when you're having an issue with something, trust God's healing for our faults because we all mess up, right? 
There's some things we can change, but there's some things we can't. So if God points out a character trait that's displeasing to Him, not someone else, but displeasing to Him in our lives, we need to work on that, right? How do we work on that? Real simple. Number one, we have to identify it. First part of fixing any problem is acknowledging there is a problem. Amen? You have to identify it. Then you have to ask Him to forgive you for letting it develop in your life. Because if it's something that's displeasing to God, you allowed it to develop. God didn't give that to you. You allowed it to develop. And so we have to ask Him for forgiveness for allowing that to develop. And then number three, ask Him to heal us from it. Because we want to be whole. We want to be complete. We, we, we want to be the best that we can be. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. You want to have that? Brother Bob's got it. Or, oh, Roger's got it. All right, Roger. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. <laughs> the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And uh, uh, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly in your whole spirit and soul. God wants us to be complete. God wants us to be the person he created us to be. The problem is sin came along, right? And so uh, we're not done. We still have a back page, so don't, don't think you're going home yet, all right? Uh, <laughs> We have seven. We're only on three. We're going to have to hurry. All right, number four, not that anyone in here has ever done that, but stop bartering with God. And so I don't barter with God. <laughs> oh, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. Yeah. Oh, Lord, if you don't, uh, oh, don't let him give me a speeding ticket. I promise I'll drive under the speed limit, at least for the next mile. <laughs> We got to stop coming back to Malthus one night after a basketball game. Howard Troman walked up there and he said, You seem to be in a little bit of a hurry, Mr. Holt. And I said, Well, I probably am. I was just frustrated. He said, Really? And I said, Yeah, we just got beaten a basketball game and I just got frustrated and wasn't, probably wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. He said, Well, you probably need to slow down a little bit. If you promise me you'll slow down, well, oh, well, you can just go on. I won't even write you a warning. I said, Okay. We got about a mile down the road and Jamie looks at me and says, I thought you told him you'd slow down. I did that first mile. What do you expect? I mean, but, but don't we try to do the same thing with God sometimes? But the truth is God accepts us, but sometimes we have a hard time accepting His love. Especially if you came from a family where love wasn't expressed. You came from a, a, a because not everyone's raised in a loving home. You came from a family where there was a lot of give and take or a lot of buy and sell. Okay? Uh, you, go, you, you go do this and I'll let you do this. Or you do this and you can do this, or you uh, conditions on everything, and and I gotta admit to you, there was a point in my life when I was that way. It goes along with that legalism a lot, but we have to stop bartering with God. Okay, we're not gonna influence God. We can't barter our way around God's will either. I preach Sunday on the call. When God calls you, God's got a call on your life, and God's not going to relinquish that call from you. You can run from it, you can hide it, you can try to get away from it, but He's not going to relinquish that. And so, a lot of times people say, well, God, I'd surrender to be a missionary, but I don't want to go to a foreign country. Then you don't really want to surrender, do you? I had someone message me last night. Well, I guess it was last night. I saw it about 6 o'clock this morning. I said, how old do you have to be, a, how old do you have to be to be a missionary? Anybody want to guess? How old do you have to be to be a missionary? I said old enough to talk. <laughs> that does help a little bit. Yeah. Amen? Because Jesus said out of the mouth of babes, mm -hmm. right? So whatever age. Now you may have to be 18 to get into another country and get a visa and all that kind of stuff. I understand that part of it. But uh, I, I said old enough to talk. I said, well, I guess I'm, I'm there. Oh, well, yeah, okay, start telling people about Jesus. Because here's the thing, if you won't be a missionary where you're at, don't expect to be a missionary somewhere else. Right. Doesn't work that way. 
uh, but but don't barter. Don't try to barter your way out of God's will. Just trust Him. If He calls you to do something, it's because He knows what's best for you. Matthew six thirty one through thirty three. Brother Gerald. Therefore, no thought, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Stop bartering with God. He wants what's best for you, but he wants you to seek him first to get it. Okay? He knows what we need, right? You said, boy, that came through just in time. Well, you know why? Because God knew exactly the time you were going to need it. Okay? And so uh, stop trying to barter with God. Number five, when you're going through emotional problems, you're trying to deal with emotions, turn outward. That's not natural, is it? When, when you have problems in your life, how many of you go talk to your neighbor? Or well, for that matter, if you have a problem in your life, how many of you go talk to your spouse? When, when we're struggling with something, we turn inward, don't we? But that's not what God wants us to do. God wants us to turn outward. When anxiety, fear, guilt, anger, rejection, uh, uh, when they come, the natural thing to do is to turn inward. But what we need to do is turn outward because God's put somebody in your path to be a witness to. Okay? You say, well, I just don't like talking to people. A smile goes a long way. Amen? Just a simple smile goes a long way. Just a simple head nod, how are you, goes a long way. Uh, and, and so turn outward because everyone has something to give. And we need to learn to give without expecting anything in return. Okay? Just because just you give somebody something, don't expect them to reciprocate it. Well, I asked them how their day was and they didn't even pay any attention to me. They didn't even acknowledge me. Okay, maybe they had a lot more going on than what you thought. Okay, it's all right. Rejection's going to come. Rejection's going to come, but they didn't reject you. They reject what you stand for. Well, they don't know what I stood for. They must have rejected me. No, 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 no. You were looking for something in return. Just give. Freely, uh, uh, Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. Right? God didn't charge you anything to give you a smile. Why you won't charge somebody else to give them one? And so turn outward, and I know that's hard to do. Number six, stop dwelling on past failures. Once we ask God to forgive us, we have no more claim to it. Why we won't go back and dig it up? Why we won't go back and rehash it? Why we won't go back, oh, I need to go back and make that right. No, you don't. You ask God to forgive you for it, God will make it right. Okay? I, here's what I challenge people. <laughs> if, if something's taking place in your life and you need to make something right, you need to ask for forgiveness, you need to make an apology, you need to do whatever, sit down and write them a letter. Because when you write out a letter, you write out your thoughts. And you can erase them and go back and reword it. You can take part of it out. You can say, well, that wasn't all I wanted to tell them. You can add something to it. But if you call them, your emotions are going to come into play and you're going to say something that you wish you hadn't said. And words once spoken are like eggs once broken. You can't put them back in the shell. And so sit down and write them a letter. And after you write them that letter and you read over it two or three times make sure it's just what you think it ought to be, then you pray about whether or not God wants you to send it to them or burn it. And what you'll find most of the time is he'll tell you to burn it. Because it's not about them. It's about our spirit or about our relationship with God. And a lot of times when we get down to where the rubber meets the road, we find out that that problem was really because of us, not because of them, right? 
and that makes it a little more difficult. But stop dwelling on past failures. God's forgiven you for it. Move on. Uh, when others try to bring up your past, remind them that it's forgiven and it's forgotten. And turn to the positive things in life. Look for the positive things in life. Psalm 97.10. Anyone? Brother Tom? Deliver you out of the hand of the wicked. He that loveth the Lord hate evil. Do you really hate evil or you just kind of shoulder up to it once in a while? Born again child of God are to hate, are to hate evil. Okay? Don't live in the past. That's why it's the past. You know why the, the, the back window on a car is usually only about half the size of the front window on a car? because the direction you're headed is more important than the direction you've been. I'll tell them one of the greatest lessons I ever learned in my life. I learned off of a movie that wasn't too great called Cannonball Run. You ever see that movie? Yeah, see, I'm in better company now. Other people have seen it too, so I can go ahead and talk about it. Now, on Cannonball Run, it's a race across America, and uh, the guy gets into this car, and he, he reaches up, and he grabs hold of the rearview mirror, and he rips it off and throws it out the window. And the other guy in the car that was his co-pilot looked at him and said, what did you do that for? And he said, because what's behind me is not important. If you're going to win the race, what's behind you is not important. What is it Hebrews says? Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It's a race. What's behind us isn't important, all right? And so then number seven, and we'll be done, ask the Holy Spirit for help. You ought to know by now, and, and you already knew before this, we can't do anything without the help of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. Brother Bob, you got that? I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it's not <coughs> the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. He said, I'll give you another comforter. And that's why Jesus had to leave was to give us another comforter. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, part of that ministry is to guide us, to give us guidance and to help us make wise decisions. And so ask him to guard you from evil. Before you start your day, before you ever leave the house, you need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guard you from evil. Okay, when folks get saved, I'll, I, I generally always try to say, Lord, I pray you put a hedge of protection about them. Okay, because they need guarded from that evil that's out there. And so ask him to guard you from evil. Give him charge over your daily life. How many of you are schedule makers? You, you have a set schedule? Da -da 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 and I mean, it, it starts, you, you get up at precisely 8.05 and you do this and you, or whatever it is, you do this, you do this. And you, uh, well, all I can tell you is you've never tried to hurt a bunch of guys framing houses because them guys do what they want when they want most of the time. And most of the time they show up at starting time or just a little bit after and uh, they're always ready to go by quitting time or a little bit before, you know. Uh, and, but, uh, uh, it, it, you know, I've said before, my old dad was working in the oil field and he asked that driller that day, he said, what do we take off for lunch? And that driller looked at him and laughed and said, one glove. <laughs> that's it. You just keep on going. And uh, uh, so it's like herding cats sometimes to have a set schedule. And as a result, I don't have a set schedule. Now, uh, there's days I get here at 7.30. There's days I get here at 7 o'clock. There's days I get here at 9 o'clock. Okay? But there's also nights that I go to bed at 9 o'clock. There's nights I go to bed at 11 o'clock. Last night I went to bed about midnight. Okay? And so I don't have a set schedule. People say, well, what time do you eat lunch? Whenever I get hungry and get close to a place that has food. Okay, I don't have to eat it straight up 12 o'clock. Okay, I don't have that schedule, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, but what I am saying is we schedule everything else in our life to a degree, but we don't ever let God have charge of anything. Okay, one of the reasons I never go to a specific place for lunch, somebody will say, well, you want to go to lunch, da 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 Well, let's see what that day brings. Okay, because I don't really know what that day brings. I can get up in the morning and the whole day go out the window in a hurry. Somebody call and this is, is of more importance than having lunch. Okay, so we just don't do lunch. Okay, but uh, if you give God charge over your life, 
God will put you wherever you need to be to eat lunch to witness to somebody. God will put you wherever you need to be to go to the grocery store after work to witness to somebody. God will put somebody in your path. Remember everyone back when I talk, talked about looking for Jesus in all things? Do you really look for Jesus in all things? Uh, and, and so ask him to give him, give him charge over your daily life. Trust him to bring people you need into your life. There's people that you need in your life. There's people you need in your life. Uh, you, you need a doctor. You need a preacher. And depending on how you live, you may need a lawyer. You know, even Jesus didn't have anything to do with lawyers, right? And so, anyway, um, yeah, I'm just kidding. I forget sometimes people are lawyers. And so, uh, anyway, uh, so why is the Holy Spirit referred to as the Spirit of Truth? Because He said, uh, "Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth in you." If you have the spirit of truth living inside of you, it shouldn't be a, 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 a rocket science to figure out right or wrong. Bible says it's right, it's right. Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Pretty simple. And if you're saved, that spirit of truth lives inside of you. And when you start to do that which is wrong, you say, oh, boy, my conscience got the best of me. No, it didn't. The Holy Spirit smacked you upside the head and said, don't do that, dummy. Because he's the spirit of truth, and he wants to guide us in truth, okay? And uh, so, it, uh, why is truth vitally important to our emotional health? Because if we're not going to be truthful about things, we're just beating our head against the wall, aren't we? You've got to be truthful about things. you got to own things that you messed up on. You gotta, uh, now, you don't have to live there the rest of your life, but you got to own it sometimes. And we need to understand that our relationship with Jesus, uh, 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 understanding that our relationship with Jesus is the most important element of our emotional health. And I will immerse myself in his word and allow the Holy Spirit to work in my life this week. And if you'll do that, I promise you, you'll have a better week. Amen.